All right, guys, we're just getting everything uh, up and running here. Bringing everything online. We're on there. Hey, Triple Three and Jan uh, Janty Adventures, welcome on Instagram. We're waiting for uh, Facebook and YouTube to come online. I just got a pop up that Facebook. Luke Luke Ayer, how you doing, bud? Hey, sorry I missed you um, this past weekend over there in Salt Lake. So, Freddie, how you doing downstream? Welcome, Larry Bennett. Welcome, Scott Schmid. Welcome, Jay Colley. Welcome. So, yeah, Jay, didn't I see you last weekend? Yes, you did. Uh, Instagram, Co353, Junior Let Him Fly. We're getting a lot of people jumping on. So, uh, Facebook, Alex, welcome. So, uh, we'll just kind of give it a few more minutes, um, let people kind of jump in and join us. Um, but what we're going to do is, for those of you that kind of tuned in, um, I did quite a few live videos uh, while I was over there in Salt Lake this past weekend for the Western Hunting Conservation Expo. And two of the videos specifically, one of them I sat down with Jason Phelps, the other I sat down with Steve Chappell. And we kind of, uh, you know, had a couple of discussions. And tonight I just kind of wanted to expand on those a little bit. So from Facebook, John, Tim, good evening, Jack Keithley. Hello. Hello. Also, um, Jason Phelps and I talked about that. Um, we both wanted to sit down and kind of expand on the conversation, you know, that we had down there. So there is going to be another upcoming video of Jason and I sitting down and just kind of expanding on what we'd started talking about. So, um, <laughs> Freddie wanted to be the first thing. Yeah, I know. Actually, technically, Freddie, uh, Instagram followers were the first ones on. Instagram seems to connect a lot faster. So, Brian Draper from YouTube. Good evening, James Coon, Facebook. Hello. So, uh, downstream, no showing us cool stuff tonight. I'm going to have to get a second job to keep up with all the stuff I fall in love with every week. Okay. Downstream, I will do my best to uh, not show any cool stuff, but I am going to talk about uh, some of the connections that uh, and meetings that we had over there in Salt Lake, which is going to benefit all of you guys, especially if you are Patreon members. So from Facebook, Bobby Smith, hello, Anthony J. Boyd, hello, DRock Depew, yo, how you doing, bud? Brandon Baxter, hey boss, I made a live LOL, looking forward to tomorrow's lesson. So, uh, won't be long, but we'll watch in the morning. So, okay, yeah. So yeah, definitely Brandon, looking forward to our lesson tomorrow night. Joaquin, good evening. So, all right, Sean McGarry from Facebook, hello. So, all right, let's jump into it. So, Hey everybody, my name is Michael Batiste. I'm from the Elk Calling Academy and this is Wapiti Wednesday Q&A. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We broadcast every Wednesday right around 7.30 Mountain Time to Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And usually we pick one topic and we kind of start discussing that. But the cool thing about this, since we're on the live, we're on the fly, no matter which platform you guys are on, you have the ability to ask questions and I will answer those questions to the best of my ability without interfering with the individuals paying for lessons or the paid patron members. Um, you know, the Patreon we do have, especially for the herd bulls, we have a uh, basically a uh, video series that is learning how to elk call. It's the same things that I teach in the one-on-one -on -one lessons, just in the Patreon form. Cool thing about that is you get access to that video all the time, as long as you are a Patreon member. So, all right, Charles Buchanan from YouTube. Hello, Tom Chafin from Facebook. Good evening, Scott Schmidt. Patreon is legit. Scott, I appreciate that. Mike Strong, I'm working tonight, but I finally made one live instead of just watching the replay. Cool, Mike, take advantage of it. If you got some questions, throw them in. Mad Viking. Vincent Calvo, hello. Here we go. So, okay, no matter which platform you guys are on, if you're liking the content that you're seeing, make sure that you like, subscribe, or follow, depending on the platform. So, all right. Um, so, Jaragon, 
wild at heart. Welcome, guys. So, Hart Cowden Gibson, what's up, brother? Welcome, welcome. So, okay, so one of the things, um, Bobby Smith, do I get a decal with that? Yes, I know. I have decals in. I need to throw them out. So, all right. A couple of the things that we talked about this weekend really brought a lot of things to mind. And I don't know, at first I thought it was kind of, you know, Steve Chappell and I were talking about this. Maybe we're kind of old school and, you know, with, with our approach to archery hunting. But what's funny is the more people that I talk to down there and the more people that I kind of talk to in line, it, uh, there's a lot of people that have this same mindset. And so, one of the things that that Steve and I were talking about is, you know, we got into archery to get as close as possible um, to the elk. I mean, that's that's a challenge. There's a skill there, and it seems like nowadays there's kind of a new breed in hunter that is okay with taking an eighty or ninety yard shot on an elk. And Jason and Steve and I all kind of talked about this and. The reason we want to get as close as possible to an elk is we want to remove as many variables that we can't control out of the equation. And one of those things that you can't control, and, and Jason made this comment, is none of us can guarantee that that animal is going to take a step or that he's going to dive or something's going to happen on the shot. The difference is, is when you're shooting 20, 30, 40 yards the arrow impact distance because of that step versus shooting 80 and 90 yards. Plus there's a whole lot, a lot of factors of, you know, your momentum of your arrow, um, you know, your penetration potential. There's a lot of things that really diminish the farther that animal is out. Now, what I find is interesting is, is a lot of people that I talk to that have a lot of experience their maximum yard was about 45 yards. Now, I'm in no way sitting here telling anybody what their maximum effective range should be or what their ethics should be. But when you have a group of experienced elk hunters saying 45 yards is about the max distance on a first shot, there's something there. Why? Um, you know, and one of the things that, you know, we all talked about, if you've ever been on a blood trail that goes for miles, that you're on your hands and knees crawling to find pin drops of blood in grass, it is such a gut-wrenching experience to go through. Because, um, I mean, re really, we have an obligation to harvest these animals as quick and humanely as possible. So, um, so that's all why we kind of, you know, feel that way. I'm not saying that you couldn't take an 80 or 90 yard shot. And that's the thing we all said. If you have one arrow in a bull and he's still on his feet and you got to get a second arrow in him, by all means, take that shot. But that first initial shot, and we were trying to figure out why. Um, you don't, so junior, let him fly. You don't want to wound the animal. It deserves your best shot for giving up its life. Exactly. Uh, let's see. We got a couple other comments rolling in. Um, <laughs> Scott, Ooh, you're going to hurt some feelings. I know, I know heart cowed and I'm all about five yards. Jeremy Gillum from YouTube. Hello, Lucas. I wish LOL can't seem to break the art 80 yard barrier. And, and, and we're going to kind of touch on some of that. There's, there's a few things that go on. Beyond many other factors, the experience of the animal up close in person is, ir is irreplaceable. Nick, exactly. You get a bull up in your face and screaming. I mean, it is such an adrenaline rush that is just nothing like anything else you've ever experienced. Um, don't want to wound anything. Plus, nothing beats the adrenaline up close and personal. Uh, Michael, side question, best clothing for 85 plus degree hunt days in the sun and heat. Jeremy, curb that. We will talk about that coming up. Uh, Tex Grant, hello. Uh, Hart, I questioned a shot on a 370 bull at 58 yards. I hesitated and lost the opportunity. I have hunted the bull for two years. You told me Saturday I might made the right call. Absolutely. So especially on a record book class animal like that heart 370 I mean there's not very many 370 inch bulls running around and I mean really 
once you get in there, especially if you're hunting, you know, thick timber, a 40 yard shot is a long shot. I mean, you've got to make sure that there's no branches, there's all kinds of things. And, and I think part of it is, and, and Steve and I were talking about this quite a bit, and I remember early on, my first experiences, you know, with elk coming in, you almost kind of get anxious. Like, oh my gosh, there's my shot opportunity. I have to take it now. That that patience factor of, you know, letting everything really develop and letting everything progress. And the thing that I found over the time by being patient, that one shot opportunity I had actually develops into a better shot opportunity by being patient and let your setup work for you. Um, it's amazing, you know, what you think is, is a 35 yard shot and you're like, okay, that's the best I'm going to get. But you kind of wait a little bit and the next thing you know, that bull continues walking forward. And now next thing you know, you have an 18 yard shot. So um, patience is one of the things. And as a new hunter, it's one of those things that is really, really hard. Because, I mean, let's face it, guys, elk hunting is tough. They live in, in tough country. You're expending a lot of energy, um, you know, covering ground. Um, getting <laughs> Jeremy, I'm old and I can't see that far. Maybe that's part of it. I, I don't know, but, um, but yeah, the patience thing. And it's, 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 it's amazing how, you know, as you develop that patience and, you know, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week. No, it was a couple of weeks ago we were talking and, and if you have one of these animals in that you, that you're, you know, in your mind, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shoot this animal see what you can get away with as far as movement and repositioning and this and that. And it's really going to teach you a lot about, because, you know, I made the comment that when you're first, you know, when you're first on your journey of elk hunting and that, that first bull comes in, I mean, you're frozen like a statue. You're almost afraid to blink because you think that animal is going to see you and then blow out of there. It's not the case. You, you really, really be surprised on what you can get away with. So, um, okay, Paul, yep, unfortunately many people don't have respect for the animal. Downstream, it needs to be said though, thank you. Pat Finney, how you doing? Uh, slinging sticks, I'm almost like the newer people getting into bow hunting that think they have bragging rights for 70 plus yard shots. Personally, I won't go more than 50, just don't wanna take a chance. There's so many variables that can happen, it's crazy. Scott, it's better to wonder if you could have made the shot that you passed up than wonder if the bull you hit lived or died because you couldn't find it. Trevor, or uh, Scott, that is that is a tremendous statement right there. So, uh, I am a whitetail hunter heading west this fall with my bow for my first elk hunt, heading to a wilderness area. Which approach do you suggest, backpack, bivy hunt, or base camp? Okay, let me kind of finish up on a couple of things, Trevor, and then I'll, then I'll touch on that. So, okay. I don't know how many of you guys over on Instagram um, follow Opal Butte Outfitters, uh, but they posted a video today that was from a few years back that was a 43-yard shot quartering away. And they, they, they were afraid to post the video because of being ridiculed. It was kind of a, a rough pass or, or a rough shot choice at that yardage, kind of a lower percentage with quartering away. They did hit the animal um, and they ended up finding the bull dead several days later. So it's one of those things. And unfortunately, you know, you should go follow them on Instagram and read this post because there's a lot of people that will take a shot like that and then they'll go, ah, the animal's going to be fine. It's going to live. Unless you have 100% laid your eyes on that animal knowing that he's still on his feet, he's still moving, he's still bugling, he's still breathing, you can't say for sure that that animal is going to live or die. Okay, you don't know what happened, you know, to that area, that arrow, and especially at longer yardages where you're really not 100% sure where you hit that animal. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people today that will take that long shot, hit an animal, follow it for 100 yards or so, no, no blood, that animal is going to be fine. Or they'll find a couple of pin drops. Oh, it's just a, it's just a leg wound or a shoulder wound. It'll, it'll be fine. So, because we all go out each fall, 
and we all find carcasses and skeletons and there's usually an arrow sitting there. Now I understand that animals can get lost. It happens. But I think some of these are from these individuals that are sticking arrows and just going, eh, it'll be fine. The other thing that I kind of noticed too, and I asked Steve, and if you guys haven't been to our YouTube channel and watch these videos, I really strongly encourage, but I asked Steve what advice he would give to a new elk hunter. And I think his answer is absolutely perfect. Steve's answer was quit focusing on punching a tag and focus on the journey at hand. Focus on everything that's going around you. If you call in a bull to 40 yards, that's a successful hunt. Now, again, I'm not here to define your definition of success. Everybody's definition of success is different. And maybe it's, you know, we're, we're old school or I, I don't know. But I think so much has been placed on the punched tag and how quick I got it done and how far the shot was because we all see it on social media every hunting season. There's really two types of posts. The first is what does he score? The second is, well, he's not the biggest on the mountain, but if you have to justify or start with that, then why did you harvest the animal? And if you're just quick to post because you're wanting likes and follows and stuff like that, you're in this game for the wrong reason. Because I'll tell you what, guys, this is going to be my 31st year of elk season, and I'm still just as passionate about chasing elk today as I was 31 years ago. It is so much fun to chase these animals, to match wits with them. And, and plus the whole journey, I mean, here in the forest come alive in the morning, the sights, the sounds, the smells, there's just so many things. Plus the other thing that we kind of noticed is a lot of new people coming in are basically, yep, this is going to be my first year of elk hunting. I'm going to go out and I'm going to shoot a 350 class bull or nothing. Good luck. I remember how my adrenaline was. I remember how my adrenaline still is on elk. If you are brand new and you can keep your com composure with the first bull that you call in being a 350, kudos to you, man. You got ice running through your veins. Junior, let him fly. You got to crawl before you walk. I absolutely love that. Absolutely. But basically what we're trying to say in a couple of these videos is just go out. Enjoy the experience. You know, get, get an animal or two on the ground under your belt. Find out what that's like. Harness all those experiences. It's only going to make you better in the long run when you do get the experience or you do get the opportunity at a world-class bull. You're going to be a much better hunter. You're going to be a much better shot. You're going to handle the situation better, and it's going to be a heck of a lot more fun. So, okay. A uh, couple of questions I want to roll back to. One, about the camo for 85 plus degree weather. So there's, there's a few companies out now that have performance layering system that basically they're designed for that. They are designed from hunting 85 degree weather to, um, you know, zero degree weather. You know, companies like Kuyu, Sitka, you know, Scree Gear. Um, I had a great meeting with Scree Gear again. We got on camera last year and introduced the company. We actually just uh, filmed again this weekend. If you guys haven't watched that, go watch it because we talked about the materials. But a couple of things about the Scree Gear is I call the Scree Gear Working Man Sitka because of the layering system that it has, but the bundles that they offer also. And the cool thing is, Mike really believes in the Elk Calling Academy and all of you guys, so he extended the show special pricing. So all you have to do is go to Scree Gear, look at their pricing, look at their bundles, look at their gear. If there's a bundle or gear that you're interested in, 
pick up the phone and call them. Say, hey, I'm a member of Elk Calling Academy. I'm interested in this. They will extend that show pricing to you guys. That says something about them. So I know Elk Slayer. I don't have any good recipes for antler. You know, I've tried chewing on some of these on the wall. They're just not very good. I think my dog enjoys chewing on them better. So, so to answer your question about what gear do I recommend for 85, 85 plus degree or even down to zero, Scree gear is actually the gear that uh, I strongly believe in and really, really like. So, all right. Um, Whitetail hunter, you know, heading into the wilderness area, which approach, approach do you suggest? Backpack, bivy hunt, or base camp? So, Trevor, early on in my career, I was a uh, go back in seven, eight, nine miles, set up camp, hit, you know, hunt those areas, but it was a lot different you know, back then in the early and mid nineties, cause we didn't have wolves, you know, we didn't have the number of hunters out there. So I've really kind of evolved into a base camp type hunter that I can jump in my truck and drive 25, 30 miles either way. If I need to hit another trail or if I want to go out in the morning or the evening and, and, you know, night bugle to locate elk, which we do quite a bit. So I really, really like base camp. Now, the other thing is, is since you're coming out west, you don't have that time to scout that area. You don't have time to spend a lot of time in that area. So really, if you're on a seven day hunt, you get to the trailhead, it's going to take you half a day to get in there and set up camp. Now it's going to take you a, a day, day and a half to hunt that area. And if you figure out that there's no elk there, now you've got to come back, tear down camp and come out. Now two and a half days is gone, relocate, get back in three days. That only leaves four days of your seven day hunt to locate elk in that new area, encounter an elk, get an elk on the ground and then get it out. So it's really, really tough. But the nice thing with base camp and the truck is you can cover a lot of ground and you can bugle up into canyons and you can locate elk so that way each morning when you go out you are constantly on bulls and you are constantly in elk every day so now all of a sudden your seven day hunt you have the opportunity to be into elk l seven days versus the other you might only be into elk one day so trevor hope that answers your question that's just my recommendation so uh, James, it's become far too important for many to have the kill picture trophy shot. Many only worry about getting to the Z. The through Z is just important. So many are willing to take chances. Um, absolutely. And the other thing is too, I actually talked to quite a few people that were successful last year with a cow or a spike, but they were afraid to post their picture because they were afraid to get ridiculed. That's ridiculous that we have got to that point that you can't even post a trophy. I'll tell you what, any elk with a bow is a trophy. Um, I mean, I've shot a couple of cows in my career. I'm not too proud to say it. Fed my family great for the, for the year. I mean, we eat a lot of elk. I mean, you know, putting an elk in the freezer every year is my main objective to feed my family. Yeah, it's great to have these things hanging on the wall and look at, but when it comes down to it, Feeding my family is more important than a trophy on the wall or my name in a record book. So, all right, uh, Charles, hey, checking to see if any hunters in Western Washington on here. Uh, so here we are with this. If any of you guys are from Western Washington, uh, you know, I know Charles, he's a, he's a student of Elk Calling Academy. We've done several one-on-ones. He's been really looking for um, somebody to team up with and uh, hunt with. So... If any of you are from Western Washington, get a hold of me. I will get you Charles' contact information and vice versa so you guys can chat. So, Mike Strong, who will pass on an animal if it's legal? Put meat in the freezer. Hallelujah. I love it. So, Luke, first bull I shot, got excited and rushed it, hit him high and never found him. Worst feeling ever. And yeah, I, I mean, things happen. Even at close yardages, things happen. I remember a bull that I called in. Uh, several years ago for for one guy. I mean, it was just a perfect call in. Called him into 10 yards, heard the bow go off. I heard a hit. Bull runs off. I was excited. I ran up to him and he was trying to figure out why I was excited. I thought he got his first elk. The arrow was sticking in a stick on the ground about six feet in front of him. He drew back and never even came to his anchor point, never even looked through his peep, nothing. 
and just it's it's one of those things and he was brand new that was the first opportunity he had ever had in an elk so des i love it a picky man is a hungry man and i ain't a hungry man i love that phrase you guys are awesome so uh many people think it's their right just to shoot and kill an animal uh hit mine followed almost five hours on a doubtful shot, I agree on a pass, but if a cow is standing at 30 yards broadside, I'm not going to pass and wait for a six point. Absolutely not. And here's the thing. So, you know, everybody, we all understand and know our shooting ability. So if you have a shot opportunity and you don't feel comfortable on the shot and you pass it, I applaud you. I'll stand up and salute you. So if you don't feel comfortable with the shot, don't take it. And if somebody's going to ridicule you because you didn't take the shot, maybe that's not a person you want to hang around with or talk with because they weren't in your shoes. They don't know the situation. You can describe it, but without physically being there, seeing it, there's no way. There's absolutely no way to know exactly what is going on in that situation unless you're standing right there. So... Uh, Charles, absolutely. Oh no, more blood. He's good. Really is guts plugged the hole and he's bleeding internally. All right. Let's see if we have any, uh, other questions to do, 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 do Trevor go prepared for all three. If you can score isn't anything. Okay. So I'm going to touch on this real quick. Um, one of the videos that we also did over there was with initial ascent. Uh, they're a new pack company right here in the Boise Valley area. Uh, we sat down with them, let them tell their story, introduce their packs. And then I also uploaded a second video that was a follow-up video of me trying on the pack. And I'll tell you what, guys, I was absolutely blown away about how good that pack, pack felt. So... I sat down with Dennis and Joe, the owners, and we have an offer for you guys. So you guys have heard me talk about the Patreon page that we have. It's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Once you go there, you can actually, in the right-hand corner, you can click Explore Creators. You can search for either Elk Calling Academy or Michael Batiste. Once you're on that page, you can become a Patreon member. As soon as we reach 100 patrons, I am going to draw one random patron from the group and one of you is going to win an initial ascent pack. The other thing we did is I sat down with Scree Gear. Once we reach 200 patron members, we're going to again draw one random winner and that person is going to win an extreme weather bundle from Scree Gear, which has 16, 17 pieces. It basically has every piece that they make. We already know at 400 members, somebody's going to win a free hunting bow. And then at 500 members, we sat down with Backcountry e-bikes that as soon as we get 500 Patreon members, 500 patrons, again, going to draw a name and somebody is going to win a Backcountry e-bike Mule 750. So we have some great great giveaways for you guys so uh let's see steep and deep outdoors last year was my first year bow hunting bull at 65 broadside i passed because only practiced to 50. hardest thing i have done hunting tons of people gave me crap mind blowing i applaud you the fact that you had only practiced to 50 you did not push that limit and you stayed within your comfort zone I think you absolutely made the right decision. So, all right, let's see if we have any other questions rolling in. I agree about the journey. You can't eat horns. I love to see that you guys are all the way. Heart, I shake when I call in a spike. I've hunted elk with a bow for eight years. You know, this is going to be my 31st and I still shake. My hunting partners make fun of me so bad about me shaking but you know what the day that i stop shaking is the day that i stop hunting so still it's still there had bulls between 18 yards and 80 yards not a good shot but it was fun exactly enjoy the experience enjoy that journey 
Uh, Jay, well, I'm into hunting because me and my family live on game meat. I agree, we do too. Trevor, do lots of e or, or Trevor, do lots of e scouting. Uh, I would post any elk I got with a bow. Perfect. So you guys get it. That's what I love. Kelly Ford, how you doing, bud? Okay. <laughs> I'm from BC if Charles wants a hunting buddy. So Charles, Vincent Calvo, he's from British, British Columbia. So uh, both you guys um, email me your contact information. I'll get you guys in touch with each other. So not saying that you're wrong, but I will say this is just your specific reasoning, not the only right reasoning. Uh, Nick, I don't know if that's in response to somebody. So passed on a bull. So, okay. Um, Tomorrow could be Christmas if I draw my out-of-state Wyoming tag. Find out tomorrow. Danny, best of luck to you. I hope you do draw it. So, Mike Thompson, I'm calm when, calm when the bull runs in, but my heart races when they walk in slowly. It, it's kind of funny, too, how, you, you know, depending on how they come in, sometimes they come in so fast that you almost don't have really a time to think about it. It's almost just a reaction state that you get into. Uh, but other times, if it's kind of a long, drawn-out process, yeah, you've got a lot of time to, you know, really, really think about those things. So, what the heck is going on? I don't know what that uh, chiming noise is, so we'll just mute that. Uh, Stever, I hunt with a 50-pound trad bow. You hear or know of people hunt with a recurve or a longbow. Yeah, actually, I have a lot of friends that actually hunt with recurves and longbows. And in fact, that's one of the things that I've actually considered. I, I started shooting with a 45-pound takedown bow um, back in 1984. Um, I never hunted with it. I, I did, you know, shoot, uh, shoot fish and carp with it. But yeah, one of the things that I've thought about is going back to the simplicity of a recurve or a longbow. So yeah, I've got buddies that go out each year. Uh, they're consistent with harvest. They get it done all the time. And yeah, trad guys, I mean, your shot selection, your your effective range is, is even closer. Um, and that's one thing that I absolutely, you know, love. So it's about the hunt and the memories made. The harvest is a, bon a bonus. Des, I agree 100%. So um, okay, so a couple of other things. Thank you to all of you Elk Calling Academy members that uh, came by when I was over there in Salt Lake. I know there were some of you that I had missed. Um, sorry I missed you guys. It was just kind of a hectic weekend with bouncing around to booths and everything else we had going on. We are getting closer and closer to the Elk Calling Academy Um Rip It Read, produced by Native by Carlton. A few of you guys over at the show actually got some. I did hand some out. Um, here, not this coming weekend, next weekend, we have the Idaho Sportsman Show here in Boise. I will be down at the show in the Scree booth. Um, and then March 14th, 15th, that weekend, the ISE in Salt Lake, I'll be back over at that show. I will have some calls with me along with t-shirts and hats and all that. The other thing with talking to a lot of you, uh, there was several of you that asked if on the Patreon, if you could just pay an annual instead of monthly. Unfortunately, Patreon is only monthly, but um, I am going to go ahead and build the website as soon as I can with the e-course on there for those of you that want to do the annual. And we will have a shop to make it easier for you guys to get the uh, Elk Calling Academy merchandise. Sorry, guys. All right, Merle, the trad and recurve guys are heroes. They are. Those are some of the most patient hunters that you will ever meet and some guys that, and gals, that you can learn a lot from. Uh, Danny, bought a Triax recently. Any idea of verdicts or Traverse is better? Um, I haven't shot the Triax yet. I... I going to try to get in this weekend and kind of do a budget bow battle. So I have shot the Vertex and the Traverse. Both the Vertex and the Traverse are great bows. Very, very smooth draw cycle. Very dead in the hand. 
In fact, I was so impressed with the Traverse that I did uh, decide to shoot the Traverse this year. So, uh, Danny, that'll just kind of tell you what I thought of the Traverse. But I will definitely um, see if I can shoot a Triax so that I can, you know, provide you feedback on on how it compares. So, just did the first 3D shoot of the year. Shot a horrible 342. Very frustrating weekend. But wore my new ECA hat. Mike Thompson, I appreciate. Um, representing so tom does anyone muzzleloader hunt also i have done muzzleloader hunt for cows in the past um could be a great time again very very challengeable or, or a challenge hunt because of the muzzleloader uh, but also one of those that can be a lot of fun and hey tom congrats you uh you, you made it onto the live feed so um now, Tom, if I remember right, you are back east. You're coming out west on your first elk hunt. Are you coming out muzzleloader hunting or bow hunting? So, uh, Shane, my father-in-law doesn't use a rangefinder. You know, I carry one, and I'll pull it out just to get some few, get a few uh, range marks. But uh, I mean, honestly, my average shot is 22 yards. So, don't really need a lot of range finding for that. 93 decaf. Hello. So. Uh, Cardin Matt, archery was not something I ever considered until my 13 year old son worked all summer to save up and buy his first bow. I went with him and was hooked. Best adrenaline rush ever. Love it. Yeah. I mean, the first time you get close to an elk and, and just the experience, I mean, I, I can still remember you know, my first experience back in, in 1988 and that first bull, you know, coming in and my gosh, I was looking down at this little, little stick and string and this, this, this little, little arrow and looking at the size of this bull. And, and I was thinking I was absolutely nuts. This is just crazy. What am I doing out here with this? Um, but you know, nothing happened on that first encounter. The bull turned and walked. And once all my adrenaline kind of calmed down a little bit, my emotions calmed down, I was hooked. I was like, oh my gosh, what an incredible feeling and an incredible experience. So, um, so Tom, you're coming out muzzleloader. Okay. Merle early muzzleloader a ton of fun so Merle and Tom maybe you guys kind of message each other and uh, you know Merle if you've got some tips to share on muzzleloader that you can share with Tom that would be absolutely great so you know, you know use this whole thing with the Elk Calling Academy guys here to talk amongst each other and that's what's cool about the Patreon page too there is a community tab in there that you guys can post questions. You can chat back and forth with one another, start discussions, um, you know, ask questions of things you want me to cover in future episodes, ask questions of things you want me to cover in the patron only live Q and A's. So, um, Scott putting on a 3d shoot in Western Oregon, March 2nd and 3rd, if you Oregon guys want practice, so there you go. Anybody in Oregon, Western Oregon, archery shoot, uh, March 2nd and 3rd. So, all right. Um, you know, Jason and I, you know, we sat down, I think it was Thursday morning when we, when we kind of, you know, talked and, you know, we talked about some of the positives with the growth happening and the popularity of, of elk hunting and some of the negatives, you know, that are kind of happening. And I think one thing that it's really going to take, um, Scott, somebody's asking, uh, steep and deep outdoors is asking, uh, where at for the shoot. So if you want to go ahead and post the location, um, I'll go ahead and share that on here. So if there, anybody is in, uh, Western Oregon, they can, they can come join. So, but the positives and the negatives. So one of the things that we kind of discussed, um, about some of the negatives is because the popularity is growing, it almost seems like the respect 
for fellow sportsmen and fellow outdoorsmen is almost kind of, you know, going out the window and going out the wayside. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about this before that another reason I base camp is because if I have a trail that I want to specifically hit, and if I get there, if somebody beat me to that trail, I'm going to go elsewhere. I'm going to go find another trail. But unfortunately, it seems in today's landscape that there's more and more people that they don't care. They'll just go ahead and pull in and park right behind you and come up the trail right behind you. And that's not doing anybody any good. You're not helping each other. You're you're actually hurting each other. So um, just be respectful, guys. That's all I can say. So, all right, steep and cheap. It is the Cascadian Bowman, about 20 miles west of Eugene. Uh, sounds like it's it's an awesome range. So, uh, Shane from YouTube, does any wear, does anyone wear Killick clothing? I think Andy Dancero was talking about Killick a couple of months back. So. I don't have any experience with Killick. If anybody has experience with Killick clothing, uh, post in the comments, you know, let, let Shane know. So uh, here we go, Mike Strong. I used some Killick clothing this year. I got it on sale at Sportsman's and it was decent for the price paid, but not great. If you need something to get you started, it's not terrible at all. So Shane, there you go. There's some feedback on Killick. Danny, uh, too many archery hunters in Utah and archery season ends before rut gets going. I assume that's in response. That's what's hard with what I have for Facebook and YouTube. It doesn't show me if you guys are actually in conversations. It just kind of kind of throws up. Uh, Mike Thompson, love Killick. So Danny Coyman, anyone try hex stuff? Yes, Danny, I have three sets of hex. In fact, when Mike Slinkard came out with hex, uh, that's when I was with Rocky and we were filming for Explorers Big Game Journal. And yeah, we all wore Hex when it first came out. Um, there definitely is something there. We could we could see a different demeanor in animals when we had the Hex on. Biggest experience we had was in Utah with a rancher's dogs. So the way he treated us, the, the way the dogs reacted to us when we had the Hex on was very calm. Uh, as soon as we had the hex off, these dogs were very, very guarded, very on edge, and not really that friendly. The thing about the hex is, is one, it's very, very warm because it actually has, it, it's carbon fiber thread that's woven in into that Faraday cage principle, which if you want to know what the Faraday cage is, when you throw something in the microwave, you turn your microwave on and you look through the glass and there's that that cage that's the faraday cage principle which locks the or, or basically blocks the electromagnetic field and that's the principle befi- behind hex but because there is that much carbon thread in there it is pretty warm so early season um, you probably won't want anything over the top um, just wear it by itself but the other thing is is you know if you're hunting with a group say you're hunting with two other people really doesn't work if you're wearing hex and the other two are not, especially if you guys are right there around each other. Uh, but I do think hex is effective. So yes, I think it works. Uh, Shane, you're gonna be at the sport, Sportsman Show here in Boise. Shane, yes I will be. I'll be down there on Saturday. I'll be in the scree booth, uh, basically from doors open till doors closed. So come down and see me. So, uh, a little blurry on YouTube, but okay. Burrs get in them big time. Yes, burrs do get in hex. There's a lot of clothing that burrs and whatnot get into. So, all right, guys, we are 45 minutes in, so we are going to kind of start wrapping it up. Last call for questions. If you have questions, throw them in. I do not have a video prepared for Friday uh, with just getting back from the show and doing lessons and stuff i haven't had a whole lot of chance to do much um i did pick up some of the new uh elk attic reads that uh, are produced by native that i'm going to get some reviews done and 
what booth at the ISE show? Danny, I will be hanging out in the Smith Game Calls booth and the Backcountry e-bikes. Most of my time will be in the Backcountry e-bikes. Vincent, any advice on bear defense, spray versus firearm? I'm a firearm guy. I always carry a pistol. I carry a Smith & Wesson 40 M&P with me at all time. And here's the deal with carrying a pistol, guys. So a lot of the packs nowadays have built-in holsters on their hip belts that you can put your pistol in. That's great. Until you get an animal down, because what's the first thing you do? You take your pack off, lay it on the ground, and it's usually 10, 15 yards away from the elk or that you're, you know, you're working on the elk and your pack with your pistol is 10 to 15 yards away. I actually prefer a bino harness that actually has the pistol holster right here on my chest so that way it's with me at all times. I mean, you're carrying this basically for bear defense, so why not have it on you at the most critical time when you're working on the animal? And that's really uh, the highest opportunity for you to have encounters with bears coming in. Again, personal preference to each their own. My recommendation is, um, and in fact, I use the Bino Harness from Black's Creek Guide Gear because it does have that pistol holder right in. So, uh, to, 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 to Mike, are you going to Tamarack in June? I got to double check the date on Tamarack because I do, I think I actually am going to be in Northern Idaho doing a seminar, a four hour seminar for North Idaho archery hunters on that same weekend. So let me double check on that. Mike Strong, any opinions on Kenetrek boots versus Crispy? I tried both at the expo and SLC and now I'm trying to decide which ones to get. Mike, I'm currently running Crispy. Uh, I've had great luck. I'm going on my third season on the same pair. They are still in phenomenal shape. I haven't had any problems with them. They don't leak. The tread is still in really great shape. Um, Kenetrek, I do know Kenetreks typically have a stiffer sole, stiffer shank in them. So, um, yeah, to each their own, what they want. So, uh, Fatal Flight, I seen a post about hoof rot online in Idaho. Has anyone seen or heard of this over in Idaho, or is it a online rumor? Uh, no, Robert, I actually read that article. Uh, there is one place um, here in Idaho, it's, it's kind of northern Idaho, that hoof rot is starting to show up. Um, still, it, it doesn't sound like it's that many, but... It is here. So uh, Fishing Game is actually working diligently to try to figure out how to curb this. Unfortunately, uh, the approaches for dealing with hoof rot in cattle is they make them walk through a trough that has medicated water and then they basically bandage up you know, the hooves of the animals. No way that they can do that with free ranging elk. So Idaho Fishing Game is trying to figure out how they're going to combat that. So they already are on it. Uh, how big is the Idaho show as opposed to the ones you just attended? Nick, the Idaho show is quite a bit smaller than the Portland and the Hunt Expo. Um, it's just kind of a small local show. But it is, it does have good numbers. There are quite a few people that do go through uh, the Idaho show here in Boise. So, Brian, are you going to be there on Sunday? No, I am not. I am only going to go Saturday only. Sunday, I'm going to focus on the family with, with sports shows and all that. I want to, uh, uh, I got to mix in time with the uh, family and keep the wife and the kids happy. So, Paul, is there a little mentoring and a lot, or, or there is little mentoring and a lot of poor sportsmanship from shooting to encounters with other hunters on trail etiquette? Absolutely. And I think kind of, Paul, one of the things that that's what Steve and I were talking about. I mean, when we were younger, you know, there was quite a bit of time spent in camp around the campfire with the old timers, you know, kind of talking. And we kind of learned from that. And it seems like that is kind of gone by the wayside. And I just, I don't know if it's because, you know, times have changed or, uh, you know, younger generation could care less what the older generation says, but I don't know. But also the thing that I've noticed too is the only thing we can control is ourselves. We can only control how 
we treat others that we run into out in the woods, how we treat others that we run into on the trail, and also how we treat others online. Treat them with respect. There's no guarantee that you're gonna get respect back, but if you're treating others with respect, it goes a long, long ways. So just remember that. Scott, working on my bugles, is there a big difference or effectiveness in how to end a bugle? There is. So the thing to remember with bulls is um, as, as a bull gets more agitated, his bugle gets shorter, higher pitched, more volume, and he falls off real sharply at the end of a bugle. So if a bull's nice and relaxed, it kind of rolls over the top of the hill and comes down softly. Now if that bull is more agitated. He's going to climb to that higher note faster and he's going to drop off a lot sharper on the back. That's a pretty good, um, you know, difference in a nice relaxed bugle or kind of uh, aggressive agitated type bugle. So hoof rot in Idaho. Yes. CWD. Um, I know there was a little bit of CWD over in Eastern Idaho. That was a little while ago. I haven't um, heard much about it lately, Hart, so I don't know. So, Rick, check out the BC Harness. Absolutely. So, that is the one that I'm talking about. Uh, Michael Batiste, there's a Blue Mountain Archer shoot at Tucannon in Pomeroy, March 16th and 17th. Okay, so for you Western Washington or Eastern Washington guys, March 16th and 17th, 3D shoot there in Pomeroy, Washington. Show. We can't carry handguns in Canada, such BS, but was thinking shotgun. If you've got a pack that you can actually kind of attach a shotgun on, Vincent, that might be a way to go. Mike Strong, Rasco makes a great holster that attaches to Bino Harness. Great information. I'll, I'll check that out and see what I can find and kind of give review. Why do you cut the flared end off of your unleashed tube? I know you've said, but I can't remember. Walking brain fart. So, Bill, I just prefer it. Um, I, I, I just I, I prefer the smaller end. For me, it's just a little bit more comfortable. The way I kind of hold my mouth and call into it, um, it's it's just personal preference. Whether you want the small end or the flared end, definitely um, personal preference. But for me, I just one of the first bugle tubes I had when I really got into diaphragms had the small end on it. So it's just what I've learned on. It's what I'm, what I'm comfortable with. So, uh, to do, to do, to do, uh, crispy plus one on crispy, great boots. Uh, do you see CWD might have a cure? Yes, I did see that article. Definitely a, a lot of uh, great promise in that article. It'll be interesting to see how that kind of evolves a little bit more. Mike Thompson, 22 Outdoors, will be at the Redmond Show. So if you guys are down there, hook up. Uh, a dentist, my brother is one. In, oh, okay. Need a dentist. Danny, your brother's one in, in Boise. So uh, steep, and, steep and Deep Outdoors, a little early, but if any youth tag holders for Tioga in Oregon for elk want help, we would love to help out. We can just give areas if they don't want us there we will help pack whatever youth prefer okay so if any of you guys are in oregon you have youth hunters in the tioga area reach out to steep and deep outdoors they'll help you with the uh hunt uh to do to do to do do i have any issues with outfitters and how do you feel about them no there's a lot of great outfitters out there i actually have personal friends that are outfitters and guides there are some great ones out there. They take a lot of pride in your success and they work their tails off. Uh, Opal Butte, um, there in Hepner, uh, Casey Hawker, Dave Padilla, those guys are a great example of an outstanding outfitter. Um, Tom and Don Carter with Deadwood Outfitters here in Idaho is another example of a great outfitter. Um, 
so yeah, there definitely are great outfitters out there, but on the flip side of the coin too, you kind of have some shady ones too. So if any of you are considering um, using an outfitter, do as much research on them as you can. Don't just go to one place and read one review or something. Get the whole picture. You dig deep enough and you are going to end up finding a negative review or a negative comment on any business. The only question is, is when you read that, is that negative or is that bad review? Is it something that you agree with? Or maybe it's like, you know, that's kind of trivial. It really doesn't bother me. So um, really, really do your homework. So Vincent, I'm currently trying out some Wayne Carlton domeless reeds and find them harder to master than the Wapiti Outdoors Reaper domed reed. Yeah, reason being is, Vincent, on a, on a traditional or conventional reed, you have to position it differently in your mouth than you do a domed reed. Now, remember, raised angle palate plates, domed reeds, those are designed to go farther forward in the roof of your mouth, and those were designed to eliminate the gag reflex. That conventional reed that you're using actually is designed to go far, farther back in, the, in your mouth. So... If you're struggling with that conventional read, try moving it back a little bit. Um, you know, one of the question that kind of um, came up is optimum position. You know, what's the optimum position? Everybody's a little bit different. A good starting point, here's a little calling tip for you guys. Without a read in your mouth, just go shh, shh. Feel how your tongue rolls, where that tongue rolls, shh, feel where that is hitting the roof of your mouth. Then you want to position the reed in the roof of your mouth so that the front edge of the call is kind of in that location in the roof of your mouth. That will get you in a good starting position. Then you can shh to start making noise on it and you may have to move it just a little bit forward or a little bit back to really find where you get that good seal and you can really start making noise and get going on the diaphragm read the thing is is when you're making adjustments forward or back less is more don't do big adjustments just move tiny little bits until you find that so heart herd bulls tend to bolt when bugles Okay, when bugle that in my in where you hunt, is this common everywhere? Well, Hart, give me more information. Is it the bulls bolt whenever you bugle at them or whenever a person bugles at them? You know, how do they respond to when it's an actual other bull bugling at them? Because I think really what it is 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 if they're bolting when people are bugling at them, it uh it, it kind of goes back to a couple of, you know, few episodes ago where we talked about, you know, what are you saying? Uh, there's so many people that think that they're throwing out location bugles, but really they're just running around challenge bugling. And yeah, bulls are going to move away from that if they're not in that mindset. So you kind of got to be careful of, of what you're saying. So Jay, it was a privilege to watch and hear you in the elk calling contest. Jay, I appreciate you guys being there. Thank you. Um, I, I've watched the video several times of the calling contest from Saturday. I'm happy with the way I called. Again, that's something that's that's something that I can control. Is is the routine that I put together. I can't control what the judges think. So, you know what? I kind of saw that as practice for the World Championships. Like I said, happy with the way I called. Kind of got a couple of tweaks that I will kind of play around with getting ready for um, the regional qualifier on the 14th, 15th there in Salt Lake. So uh, I suck at calling, but most likely it's anyone bugling. Yeah, it's probably the type of bugle that they're throwing out hard. They're probably being aggressive when they need to be kind of passive and relaxed. So it's almost like you walking into a room and instead of hi saying hi, you're walking into a room and just telling everybody to F off. That's the best way I can put that analogy. Idaho Elk Slayer. I've tried at least 50 reeds over the years and have never been able to make an elk noise. I use tube and voice. Some people are that way, whether it's allergic reaction or uh, gag reflex, they just can't make it happen. But anyways, guys, I'm getting the clock telling me we have 30 seconds left to go. 
Again, I appreciate each and every one of you tuning in tonight. I appreciate all of you guys kind of, you know, making comments, asking questions. This is all about you guys. Had a blast again tonight. So as always, keep calling, keep practicing. Most importantly, guys, have fun. And we will see you guys next week on the next Wapiti Wednesday Q&A brought to you by Elk